Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, November 28th, 2023. Tonight's broadcast is on communication and differentiation. I was supposed to do this last week. I had some tef- technical difficulties. I had to send my computer in, wait a few days, felt absolutely naked without it, but I'm glad to have it back. Everything's reset, and I'm really happy to be doing this broadcast this evening. This, I think, and, and, and I want to take it as slow as I can. I think this is a really important broadcast because I think so often we think of communication tools and skills as the solution to a lot of our problems, but I'm going to talk about tonight about how they're really just the tip of the proverbial iceberg, that they can help us, but but what they help us to do is really to start off with a clear connection to ourselves. And then secondarily, the way that we think about them in terms of connecting to others, they can be helpful in that in that camp also. But I'll talk about that as we go along. Before I get into the content, I want to make my announcements. My my finding you intensive is coming up. The next one is December 6th or 10th. I actually think we have a spot left in that one. If for some reason you have a last minute opportunity or you're local, December 6th to 10th is the next offering January 17th or 21st after that. And of course, we have an online opt-in option. I believe that the intensive work that we do at Evoke is the most important and valuable contribution you can make to your child's life, to your marriage, to all of your relationships. I, I believe, we believe that the foundation of our relationship problems and our relationship success lies in having a relationship with ourselves, unraveling our own history, our own programming understanding our own trauma that is undealt with and how that small or big, it doesn't have to be big T trauma. It doesn't have to be dramatic, but how that trauma affects our daily lives, our daily relationships and our parenting and, and our, and our couples, our partnerships. So this is something I believe in. I've said it over and over again. If you don't want to go to evokes, find somebody's to go to that does the same kind of work. I do have faith that ours is at a higher clinical level level than others. But at the same time, if for whatever reason you have any hesitancy to attend Evokes Finding You, you can find several uh, uh, similar types of programs out there that really delve into your family of origin, where you come from, the messages that you had. And really, as somebody said to me re- recently, being able to recognize that the voice that you carry around inside of your brain, inside of your head, is, is really something that came from somewhere else. And that even recognizing that is the start to to having success with coming to terms with what it's telling you, what it's teaching you, what it's telling you about yourself and about the world. So we also have online options. Like I said, we have a returning to you, which is a sequel. We have a finding connection workshop, which is a couples workshop that will be run by myself and my wife. And then you can sign up for or inquire about finding connection workshops for couples or parents and finding family for families. Contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. For more information, I'm going to start with this slide from the journey of the rogue parent. And before I even begin with this, this is a, a good opportunity to remind you that if you're listening and if you're not watching live, you can always request copies of the slides. And if you want to watch the rebroadcast of the video versions of these, they're always available about 24 hours after the original broadcast. And you can watch them so that you can see the slides and the quotes, but you can always request anything from us by emailing us at webinar at evoketherapy.com. Having said all of that, let's begin. I'm going to start with the preamble, the, the, the chapter epigraph for the, the chapter in the journey of the rogue parent where I talk about communication. I wrote this. I said, communication skills help us connect to our children and ourselves. As we, begin, as we become more clear about the relationship between the events in our lives, our thoughts and our feelings, we will better be able to see our children and provide them with a safe context in which to work through their difficulties. I think that the primary responsibility that we have as human beings, and I don't mean this as as a moral imperative, I just mean what works, what's what's practical. The first responsibility that we have is the relationship that we have to ourselves, the connection we have to ourselves, the management of our own serenity. So when you think about communication skills, I want to start with how tonight, how that skill can get you, uh, can increase your clarity about what's going on inside of you. It's about ownership. 
And when I say ownership, I mean, what is yours and what isn't yours? Your belief system, the, the, the way you make sense and, and interpret events in your life, that is yours. And the more that we take responsibility for that implicit interpretation of events, in other words, how we make sense out of the things that happen to us, the more we take responsibility for that, the more we, we, we take responsibility for our own happiness, our own serenity. It's critical for me to say tonight, and this comes, of course, in the context of, of parenting, that if we make our children and our partners, for that matter, and other people, for that matter, if we make other people responsible for how we're feeling on a fundamental level, it's no wonder why our children try to make us responsible for how they feel. It's the same programming, the same idea. So when we begin to take back responsibility for our own feelings, for our own interpretations, for our own beliefs, we model for our children uh, an accountability, uh, an ability, a willingness to take responsibility for their own feelings. The difficulty with this work is that we want, it's easier for us to imagine that the problem and the solution is out there. Melanie Klein, a very famous psychologist, now, now long passed away, taught that the two stages, the two fundamental stages in life are the paranoid stage, the paranoid stage of life, and the depressed stage. And she said, we start off as children, not really understanding and differentiating between us and other. The child has no sense of other. And, and as we grow up, we have this idea that, that the things that are happening to us are the things that are determining our happiness, our peace of mind, our sadness, our anger, our frustration. That's the paranoid phase, that the, 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 the stuff is out there, the, the devils are out there, the enemy is out there. And if we grow up, if we grow up, we move to the depressed position, the depressed phase of life. And while that might sound negative, it's just the, the, the acknowledgement and the willing to take on the responsibility for our own life, our own meaning, our own serenity. But because we were all programmed, for the most part, we were all programmed by parents who told us that we were, we were responsible for their feelings for when they were upset or proud or disappointed or ashamed or frustrated or happy with us. We were taught that that, that was our responsibility, that we caused that feeling. We grew up in a, a world where we believe that everybody's causing us to feel the way that we're feeling. And we end up powerless. We end up helpless. We end up running around, rushing around, trying to fix our children. I was just looking today when I was going through some, some facts on our podcast, looking at some of the numbers. And I noticed again that the, the most listened to uh, issue was sibling trauma. And I suspect it was listened to by parents of children, not by young people or by people considering their own siblings as adults. And what I thought was interesting, because that, that, that episode is one of the most listened to. Maybe I did a good job with it. I don't know. But I think the title, it, it speaks to this idea that as parents, we think if we can make our children happy, if we can arrange them in a way that, that we think that they ought to be, then we will then be happy. But if you pause, if you slow down for a moment and imagine what that message is that, that gets sent to the child in that, it means that the child is responsible for the way that other people see them, feel about them, think, respond to them. And, and while there, there can be some value in considering how we come across, of course, I'm not saying that, but th that, that fundamental idea then leaves them a victim to, to the whims, the desires, the beliefs of their peers and later on of their spouses, their, their, their colleagues, their professors, and so forth and so on. And they, until they come into middle you know middle age and start to consider what they really want and who they really are they live this life where they're blown to and fro by the winds of other people's opinions and reactions to them so it, it it's it's incumbent upon us it's, it's our responsibility to take this work on i wrote the more important more important than the skills themselves and i will talk about the skills tonight more important than the skills themselves are how we hold our children in our minds. 
You can't cover up a feeling with, with words. What gets communicated is the feeling. So when you think about what should I say to, to my child, my, my, my partner, my, my, my friend, first ask yourself, what am I feeling? And if it's not uh, love, if it's not kindness, if it's anger or rage or hate or disgust, that's what's going to be communicated. Communicated. Sigmund Freud explained that the messages can go from our unconscious to the other person's unconscious without ever having passed through consciousness on either person's part. And that's why it's so elusive for us to unravel our childhood experience. That's what the intensives do. They do that very well through, through psychodrama and through, through the exercises that we practice there. But it's so hard to unravel the messaging because we don't know where it came from. We have the experience that the thoughts in our heads originated with us. That's what human beings experience fundamentally. When you go to psychotherapy and you have a different kind of response, that's, that's why I talk about therapy being such a fundamental issue of, of re-experiencing yourself through a different kind of person, a person who thinks and feels and believes different than, than our early context, than our, than our parents, than the big people around us when we were growing up. When you have that, that different experience, you begin to question, where did these thoughts and beliefs come from? These things that I just assumed were true aren't necessarily true. What was once bad in my childhood is now nothing. What, what was once unforgivable is now forgivable. Which once seemed to be just a, a, a statement of truth about the way the world is and the way people are was just a message about the, what our parents and the people around us, the big people around us, felt and thought about the world. Or to put it another way, I wrote, what we think about the other person is more important than what we say to them. Once we regard the other with love and without judgment, our skills, particularly our communication skills, can provide clarity and connection. When we nest our communication skills in love, positive regard, and authenticity, our ability to communicate honestly and clearly will follow. A very simple way to understand the impact of how we hold the child in our minds is this. How we think about our children is how they will think about themselves. That's probably my, my favorite discovery that I shared with you in the journey of the heroic parent. So again, it, it starts more importantly with why you're talking, why you're expressing yourself. What's the intent? What's the hope? What's the underlying, the, the meta message is what is referred to in communication theory. That's more important than how you do it. I wrote in the journey of the heroic parent, to be clear, communication is not a tool for changing the behavior of others. I'm going to read that again. Communication is not a tool for changing the behavior of others. So when you come to a program like Evokes Wilderness Program, or if you come to virtually any program in the country treating virtually anybody with mental illness or addiction, one of the things that inevitably is going to be presented to the client, the identified patient, and to the support of family members is communication skills. They're going to foster and encourage and facilitate communication. But if you haven't changed the principle, the idea in your head that the goal is not to control somebody else and that's not, that's not the way to peace and freedom, then you will inevitably use the communication schools, skills towards that end. The goal is not to change the other or to make ourselves feel better. If we do that, we are implicitly telling our children that it is their job to make others happy which predisposes them to lose themselves and can also create vulnerability to peer pressure. Children that grow up as people, excuse me, as parent pleasers, eventually become people pleasers. And then they eventually become child pleasers. Rather, we use healthy communication skills as a way of allowing two people to be fully present in their relationship. When I teach parents not to use their feelings and their words to try to guilt their children into behavioral change, I'm often misinterpreted as saying, don't tell your children how you feel. Far from it. My point is rather, we tell our children how we feel so we can be present with them and more intentional in our responses to them. I cannot overemphasize this point enough. If the use of communication skills with your child or with your partner is to get them to change their behavior 
Now it's okay to make a request. It's okay to share with somebody when you, when you touch me without asking, I, I, I might shrink or, 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 or you know, I, I might flinch in fear because I didn't grow up with, with safe touch. Of course, requesting uh, that somebody else share with you a request before they touch you is appropriate. I'm not talking about little low stakes things like that. I'm talking about the bigger decisions. Your use of drugs is causing me not to sleep at night. Your drinking to my spouse, your drinking is making me miserable. When we talk in those terms, we're, we're, we're abdicating the responsibility for our own serenity, our own lives, really, and placing it on somebody else's shoulders. And, and if you just can learn, and, and using communication skills is a good way to do this, to pause, to reflect, to use phrases like, I feel this way when this happens. I feel this way because when somebody walks away from me in the middle of a discussion, I think they're going to abandon me. Or when somebody touches me without asking, I feel scared. You start to get clear about what's going on inside of your body, your mind, your psyche. If the person that you're talking to cares and is interested in you and, and what you're asking them of them doesn't go against their needs or values, of course, they're going to respond compassionately and willingly. But if we use this, the, the communication skills as a pattern, as a way to control what our children do in school, with drugs, with, with behavior, with chores, that programming gets into them. And then we send them out into the world and we wonder why they're so susceptible to peer pressure. And of course, the answer to that is because we started it. One of my favorite tools to share with you or, or list of tools is the eight tools for connection and, and the eight tips for, for relationship, the eight tools I, I refer to it as. I have broadcasts on that. It's a chapter in the Audacity to you. These are the tools that I found to be the most consistently utilized by families, couples, individuals who, who found themselves, who assessed that they, they found themselves satisfied and in healthy relationship to other people. These are the most common things. I statements. I feel, I think, I believe, I need, I want. Reflective listening. So what you're telling me is, I'm hearing you say this. Am I getting this right? Number three is one of my most, my, my favorite of the tools because it's so underutilized and can make so much of a difference in our lives. Ask the intention of the person sharing, what would you like me to do this to, with this information? What, what, what's the intent here? Or if you're on the, the side of the center, if you're the one doing the sharing, state your intention. I would like you to listen to me. Can you hear me? Are you in a place right now where you can hear me? Or I would love to hear some examples of things that you might do that you found to be helpful in this situation. State the intention if you're the sender. Ask for the intention if you're the receiver. I have found with my children as they've grown up and with my wife, this is the most important and valuable skill in staying away from problem areas and relationships. It's also one of the most underutilized skills. Avoiding imperatives, should, ought to, good, bad, right, wrong, evil, must, need to. Th those tend to provoke defensiveness. They tend to threaten an individual's sense of sovereignty, uh, of individuation, speaking of differentiation tonight. There, there's judgment behind them. There's, there's the fear of rejection, of disappointment. So, so they're laden with a lot of emotions and energy that can shut down communication. Avoiding polarizations. You always, you never. This is the way that all, this is, this is life is miserable all over the place. Things that, that turn moments and situations and, and things that we're going through into always or never. Of course, avoiding, avoiding advice giving. I want to say this as clearly as I can. My job, my job is facilitating and encouraging growth in people. And in essence, change. That's my job. My job in raising children, I, I think, is to encourage growth 
to encourage them to, to become all that they can become. And I do it without giving any advice. It's not about this is what you should do. It's okay to say this is what works for me. This may not work for you. But advice, again, feels it's laced with a threat, with, with a moral imperative. With a, even when I'm dealing with clients and we, we come up with something where they're going to try a, a, something new with their partner, something new with their child or their parent or at work. When I find myself in those situations, I will often say, it's okay if you don't do this. Somebody says, I'm going to break up with my girlfriend. I'm going to break up with my boyfriend. My response is, okay. I'm glad you're clear on, on, on what you want to do. That's great. And if you don't, it's okay too. And sometimes they'll look at me very strange. Some of them look at me knowingly because they know that the stated intention is tenuous. I've seen it with clients in our wilderness program. I've seen it with parents over the, the, the decades that I've been doing parent coaching. Being a human is difficult and challenging. It's complex. And sometimes it takes several iterations, several cycles for us to, to extricate ourselves from a situation, a dilemma, a circumstance, a relationship. And of course, compassion to yourself and to others is a really important part of this tool. I shared humorously the other day something that somebody shared with me, a, a, a kind of a, a, a mantra, but it was humorous. And the mantra said something like this, today I will be kind with myself. Unless, of course, I make one simple mistake and then I will beat myself up for the rest of the day. And part of the reason I shared that is because it's funny. And part of it is because Mental health is not about becoming perfect or not making mistakes. It's about owning and sitting with your imperfections. Mental health is not about getting gooder, becoming good, becoming right. Mental health from where we stand is becoming who you are, which includes some deficits, some, some limitations, some patterns and cycles that are problematic. And so before you think about fixing them, think about owning them first. There's a space in between getting healthier and where we are right now. And that space is the large part of the work. It's owning it. It's sitting with it. So compassion is important. Compassion is vital to our growth and our, to our humanity. And then, of course, time out is the last of the, of the two of the tools and timeout is just acknowledging that at any given moment we can be overwhelmed or unavailable and to show up to a discussion to show up to a relationship because we should to engage in a discussion with a, a partner or a child or a parent because we should not because we can or because we want to when we show up because we should we'll, we'll inevitably end up abusing them or ourselves. So we learn to take a time out to acknowledge our own limitations, our own humanity. But of course, we don't like to do that because it feels vulnerable. We struggle with timeouts because it indicates that we have a need. And when I talk about these skills, I wrote this. I put in a staff meeting recently, I was pondering these tools as one of our staff asked about my suggestion that simply confronting people's defenses often leads to a refortification of the defense. Telling a client, for instance, you're justifying or you're in denial can provoke the defense. The staff member then asked me, isn't challenging them helpful for their growth? And I explained how confronting the defense can serve to reinforce them or drive the underlying injury further underground. In essence, it can be shameful. If we don't heal the shame, then pointing it out is going to, of course, trigger the shame. What I said was, be with the person in such a way, be with them in a safe enough way that they'll let down the wall. I don't confront justifying, but clients do it less and less with me over time. I pointed to a poster on the wall in our office, in our staff office, where the list of the, the eight tools was hung, and I explained. Those don't make you enlightened. Those skills, 
don't make you enlightened. But if you were enlightened, you would use those skills. This is how it would sound. This is how you would talk and relate to others. It is this way of being with another that makes the difference in the relationship. And for the parents that are watching live right now, and there's a lot of you, it's important to identify that in some ways, and I believe this in my heart, in some ways, our children's issues are indicators that something's wrong in the system. Something's not working. Something needs attention. Yes, the child is really in reality doing things that are harmful and dangerous. That's a fact. We know that. But that thing that they're doing, that thing that they're displaying, that symptom that is manifesting itself is a sign. And if we follow it, we'll follow it back to the bigger questions and the bigger answers that I'm talking about today. And communication skills can be one of the tools to help us find it. When I say to my wife, I felt hurt when you walked out of the room when we were talking because I thought you were going to abandon me, I am telling her about my history. I am telling her, and this is a real thing, I am telling her about the loss of my father in my childhood. I'm telling her that I believe that people that are supposed to love you can get upset or exhausted with you enough that they can leave and never come back. And that that threat that I carry around in my body has a hold on me. But that ability that I just described to you, that I just shared with you on this broadcast, that ability to articulate that has, has, is the result of years of therapy, of many, many discussions around this, and of having somebody sit across from me who loves me, who's patient with me, who's non-judgmental, who's different than my mother and father. And that difference in them has changed my relationship with me and with my issues. If your child exaggerates, this is one of the things I teach. If your child exaggerates when telling you a story related to his feelings, let him. You'd be surprised how often children eventually tone down their initial stories once they feel as if they've been heard and their feelings are validated. Instead of focusing on the other person and what they're saying, and whether they're saying it right or not. Learn how to hear what is beneath the words. Part of communication skills training helps you to understand that people hide or, 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 or cloak their feelings behind a whole bunch of other words about other things. For example, I was just teaching somebody today. When somebody comes to me and says, why? Why did this happen? Why is this person doing this? They almost never mean why. They almost always mean, I don't like it, I'm mad, I'm sad, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed. So if I can learn to hear, especially if you're a parent, if I can learn to hear what's not said, I have embodied the communication skills of reflective listening. But of course, in our effort to defend ourselves, to be the good one, not the one at fault, we're inclined to point out how somebody said something. Now, if I'm talking to the other person and they're exaggerating and, and, and using poor communication skills, I would have a different discussion with them. But for you listening tonight or watching tonight, it's a time to reflect on how you can learn to listen better when somebody's not using the skills of the tools. So why do we use communication skills? First is ownership. And referring to the story earlier, let's just say, this is a hypothetical, let's say I had been beat by my father growing up, which I have not, but let's say I have. And somebody goes to pat me on the shoulder and I flinch instinctively, right? Out of fear because of what I carry around in my body. It wouldn't be accurate to say that the person caused my fear, right? They went to pat me on the shoulder kind of a, a connecting, affirming, friendly pat. But it would be accurate to say it's my feeling. It's in me. And of course, like I said earlier, in that example, I tell my friend, I tell the person this thing about myself, or I just simply say, I'm not comfortable being touched without being asked. 
that would be an easy thing for somebody who cares about me to respond to. So it's about ownership. It's not accurate to say that I chose to feel scared either. I think that's one of the biggest misunderstandings when people teach communication skills theory and tools. I didn't choose in that example to feel afraid. I can choose not to feel afraid by doing my work over an extended period of time. But feelings aren't a choice the same way that I might choose what to eat from them. <coughs> feelings, excuse me. Feelings aren't a choice in the same way that I, I would choose the, the food that I'm selecting from a buffet. You're connecting to yourself. I mean, that's, that's the gloriousness of the heroic journey. You're connecting to yourself. You're finding yourself. And the more clear you can get about what's yours, the more clear you can see other people. Partly because you can relate to them because we're so similar, but partly because you can differentiate what's yours and what's not. If I meet somebody, for example, that has, I'll use this as an example, a, a very narcissistic presentation, I'm going to feel triggered for lots of reasons. One of them is because it's going to remind me unconsciously of my father. Of course, now it's more conscious because I've done the work. So now I can realize in that interaction that part of my stuff is in play. So I'm connecting to myself. I'm getting clear. There's something in, in communication and relationship theory that we call intrapsychic differentiation and interpersonal differentiation. Interpersonal differentiation is the connection between me and you. Intrapsychic psychic differentiation is the connection between my thoughts, my feelings, my reactions, my intents, my interpretations, my belief, my his history. It's knowing me. And communication skills, I think, and I think one of the reasons why they're they're so poorly used in in our in our world is because we don't understand that the primary value of them is for me to figure me out. Then secondarily to use them to connect with other people, because the first ingredient, if you were making a, a connection pie, a connection cake, an intimacy dinner, the first ingredient in all of those recipes is a self, an individual, a person. So the more clear you are about your person, your, your, yourself, the more capable you are of connecting to others and your lack, my lack of ability to connect to others is an indication that something is not clear inside of me. Something's murky or cloudy inside of me. We do it for clarity. We do it secondarily, like I said, for connection to hear and to understand the other person and to be heard and understood by the other person. But those come secondarily. Communication skills can work on their own. They don't necessarily require another person to participate, although that's preferred. Things go better if everybody involved is aware of the things I'm talking about tonight, but that's not going to be the case in your life. So even if you're the only one developing a, 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 an awareness, a knowledge base, a skill set around communication, you're going to be better off and you're going to hear people differently. I love it. Like when my 15 year old daughter, she can hear teachers and adults and their feelings, even though they don't state them overtly because she's been trained. It's in the air that she breathes the soup that she's cooked in. I love when, when young people leave our program, one of the challenges they leave is that they've been instructed and educated in, in ways that other people who haven't struggled with these issues have not been instructed and educated. So they go out into the world and they say, one of the challenges that I hear them say over and over again is that they understand what people are feeling and thinking, even when the people themselves don't know. Because what do we do at our program? A child struggles or says something sarcastic or doesn't want to participate in a chore, whatever, whatever the incident is, right? The behavioral incident. And we slow it down. And we get curious and we ask what's going on. And of course, their first answer is nothing. It's no big deal. I was just kidding. 
But we're patient. And we ask again. And we wait. And we do it day after day after day. And eventually, the, the, the children begin to see that my behavior has at its root unprocessed, unexpressed feelings. And if I can express them to a capable, to a capable listening adult or other person, friend, somebody who can, who can hold, who can contain my, my feelings and my thoughts, I don't have to express them indirectly through my behaviors. That's the relationship between communication theory and mental health. If I have another avenue to express myself, I don't have to express myself through these, these defenses, through these symptoms, through this, this pattern of defenses that we call a mental illness or a diagnosis. That's the process. And our participants learn that inherently. What, why not? When is it, is it indicated that you, that you are not served well by using communication skills? It's because of the why again. If you're using communication skills to modify behavior, you're in trouble. If you're using communication skills to guilt, to intimidate, to threaten, or to manipulate, you're in trouble. To guilt or the shame, the other person. I remember, I, I could use hundreds of examples. I could use examples from today. But this one stands out where the, we were in a parent group in Los Angeles, I believe. And this person, this, this parent, was really proud of themselves for having used an I feel statement, an I statement, with their child regard, regarding some help they were asking for on the weekend from their adult child. And their adult child had originally agreed to it and then bailed on them at the last minute, maybe the night before, maybe the morning of the task of the chore. I think they were helping him move some office equipment. And the, the, the parent said, I, I, I pulled him aside. He was willing to listen. And I shared my feelings with him. And everybody in the group, everybody in the circle was happy and, and affirming and applauding this parent for doing it. And then the parent shared with us, the group, and said, but my son accused me of manipulating him, of, of guilting him. And everybody looked confused and kind of supported the parent. And after a few questions, after some further exploring, we recognized that is, in fact, what she was doing, what he was doing, what the parents were doing to the child. They were trying to guilt them. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were trying to make them feel guilty so they would do the thing. Again, you can have your feelings, but if you're using them to try to control other people, you're setting them up for a lack of differentiation. And differentiation in this context is defined as the ability to be separate and connected. And both operate at about the same level. If you're doing it to make your point in a fight, to be repetitive, of course, that's an example of why it's, it's it, when it's not effective. If you're doing it to try to get agreement, sometimes if somebody shares multiple I statements with me in a row, I'll pause and say, what, what are you hoping for from this? And I'm talking about this in my personal life my, with my wife. If she's frustrated or upset or disappointed in something that's happened, and I'll, I'll listen. I'll, if I'm doing well, I'll listen. If she says it a second time and a third time, I'll often pause and say, what do you want? What, what, what are you hoping? If you want agreement, if you want me to see it the same way, that's another discussion that I'm not sure is, is, is safe or even worthy for us to, to travel down but I can hear where you're coming from. If we use communication skills to manipulate, defend, discount, dismiss, if we just use them as a, as a back and forth battle, of course, they are much less effective, even though the skill is exactly the same. I've shared this next slide with you in, in the past. I've learned that when we're on the receiving end of communication, we don't always have the same capacity. Sometimes we have no capacity. We have to take a time out. That's the zero level. Sometimes the best we can do is just to stay silent. That's better than nothing. Some of my proudest moments as a communicator are when I was only capable of saying nothing. And that happens more often than I'd like to admit. Minimal encouragers like good eye contact, nodding, saying things like, I got it, yes, uh-huh. That means I have a little more openness to me. Reflective listening, like I said earlier, is, is responding back with clarifying um, 
questions and restatements. Empathy is to understand, to really put yourself in their shoes. That makes sense. I can relate. <clears throat> Accountability is perhaps the highest level of capacity. I'm sorry, you're right. I did do that. It's important for us to recognize as the sender in a communication dyad or as the receiver that we don't always have the highest level of capacity. It's not good or bad. There's, there's not one on here on this list of zero to five that is good or bad. It's just what is. It's what you can do. So let's move from communication skills to differentiation. Eric Erickson is, is, is well known for his, his analysis of human development. I won't go through all of them. I'm going to focus on a couple of them. In adolescence, he states that this is the, the stage of identity versus role confusion. This is where the individual tries integrating many roles. Who, are, who am I? Who am I in, in my relationship with my parents as a sibling, as a student, as an athlete, working at my job? I'm trying to come up with some idea of who I am, some cohesive understanding of my role as a person. I'm trying to differentiate, individuate myself from my parents. I think one of the greatest challenges in parenting adolescents is that they're pulling away. <coughs> Excuse me. That they're pulling away and that they're trying to become their own person. And they're not doing it well. They're not doing it smoothly. Sometimes their inability to do it well or smoothly is evidence that it's not being well received by the parent. That's not always the case, but that's a good question to ask yourself. Is my child's rebellion? Is my child's distance? Because I'm struggling with what I like to refer to as their second birth. The birth of who they are. Later on in young adulthood, Erickson points out that we move into intimacy. That's the task in, in young adulthood. A lot of us, though, including myself, went from not knowing who we are, who we were, to coupling up before we figured out who we were. And we know how that ends up. It ends up in divorce. Sometimes it ends up in conflict. It ends up in confusion and distress. Perhaps dependence. Dependence on the other person. In our country, it is very, very common for people to move from mom and dad to the peer group or to a partner without having done the necessary work to figure out who they are, what they like, what they want, what they believe, what they don't believe. And that's often all of that's happening, that, that identity versus intimacy kind of transition from adolescence to young adulthood. That's happening at the same time that parents are trying to figure out and navigate what I call their third birth. Being th that middle age, that, that stage of life crisis where we decide, is this who really what I want to be? Is this the career that I want? Am I doing what I want to do with whom I want to do it? And it can look really chaotic and crazy. I love what James Hollis says, because when I talk about differentiation, which is similar to individuation. Individuation is a subset of differentiation. Individuation is, is who am I? And, and standing on my own two spiritual, intellectual, psychological feet. An individuated individual doesn't say uh, things like we believe or we think, or this is what Republicans or Democrats think, and I believe one way or the other. They become who they are. They state what they feel and think and believe and want and don't want and love and don't love. What they hate, what they admire. They state what they are and that's okay. That's enough. That's individuation. Differentiation then is the ability to, to do that and still maintain relationship with others. Hollis explained, so often the idea of individuation has been confused with self-indulgence or mere individualism. But what individuation more often asks of us is the surrender of the ego's agenda and security and emotional reinforcement in favor of humbling service to the soul's intent. Now, what he means by that is it's following the deepest knowing of who we are. 
It's deciding I don't want to be a vegetarian or I do want to be a vegetarian or I am a Christian or I'm not a Christian or I am a Republican or I'm not a Republican. I am a teacher or I'm not a teacher. It's figuring out who we are and being that person. And, and, and what he's talking about when he says the surrender of the ego's agenda, the ego, it, its goal is to keep us safe, to keep us the anxiety low. The, the, the ego's idea is to reduce anxiety. <clears throat> and and we, we subscribe to philosophies, to, to ideas, to, to constructs to take away anxiety. We become golfers. We wear golf shirts. We have golf posters on our on our wall. If you saw my office, you would see five, six guitars hanging on my wall. I'm a guitar player now. That tells you all you need to know about me, right? Instead of saying, this is who I am, and it's okay if I'm the only one being that. <clears throat> I'm really sorry for my tickly throat. <clears> throat> <coughs> I might go get a glass of water. In fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to individuate. Stay with me. I have some more to talk about. I'll edit this out of the podcast. And I'm going to go grab some water. I don't know if I would have done that if I wasn't doing this specific presentation, but uh, the lesson is 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 applicable, and this is a really important one. So I wanted to get my throat as clear as I could. So differentiation requires compromise, sacrifice, right? You can't, in relationship with a partner or with a child, you can't dictate. You have to give and you might ask the question, when is it giving too much? When is it not giving enough? And the answer to the question is yours. You get to answer the question. The answer to the question is, who are you? You get to decide when it's too much or not enough. You get to decide if you're being a doormat or you're being too rigid. You get to decide, as the old song says, should I stay or should I go? And nobody else gets to decide that for you. If you have a trusted counselor, therapist, coach, they can ask you questions about your process. But ultimately, you get to decide. When I talk about boundaries and differentiation, I love this, this context from, from my, my education, from my schooling. Salvador Mnuchin talked about boundaries for the first time, really, as the thing to study, the, the, the place to intervene in families and in couples. And he described them on a continuum. At one end of the continuum, there was rigid boundaries. At the other, there were diffuse boundaries. And in the middle was, was clear boundaries. At about the same time, similar time, in another part of the country, one, Salvador Mnuchin was working in Philadelphia, Dr. Murray Bone was working in Washington, D.C. with psychiatry students, residents. And he came up with the idea of, of looking at the same thing, but he said that it's not exactly a continuum in that way. He said the differentiation scale is from 0 to 100, his model. And that at one end of the continuum, you, you are either enmeshed and, and fused, overlapping, dependent, reactive, if you could see me right now, if you're looking, it's like taking your two hands and clasping them together. That's what fusion looks like, what enmeshment looks like. 
And instead of diffuse boundaries being at, at, at one end and rigid boundaries being at, at the other end, Bowen said that cutoff or disengagement, if you could see me right now, you would see that my two hands are you know, a foot and a half apart from each other. There's no connection. That's the zero end of the scale. At the other end of the scale, the high end of differentiation, he, he arbitrarily came up with zero to 100 as the scale. At the other end, there's, there's, there's differentiation, there's connection. If you could see my two hands right now, you would see that they're touching each other but moving independently. That's differentiation. Being in contact with, but not dependent or reactive to or with. Now, here's where I think it gets interesting. Bowen taught that everybody's family has a, a differentiation scale, a number between zero and a hundred. These are all, of course, contrived and arbitrary, but, but the model works. Let's say that you grew up in a family where it was a 65. What that number represents is if sister is upset, what's the responsibility towards her upset feelings from everybody else in the family, from mother, from father, from brother, from sister, from sibling. That's the number 65. Are they indifferent to her? Are they compassionate? Do they feel like they have to take care of her and make her happy? Do they feel guilty? Do they feel reactive and angry? Right? How reactive are they? How controlled are they by sister's upset feelings? How responsible do they feel? How do they act? And that action comes from a belief about how and where they fit with sister's di distress. So if you grew up in a 65 family, this is how your parents operated, then everybody in the family is somewhere between a 60 and a 70. I'm making up the numbers, but they're, they're in that range. They're close to it. And then you go out in the world. Let's say you go out into the world as a 65. The only people that really make sense to you are the people near your number. The people who, who are indifferent to sister's distress, they don't make any sense to you. They don't seem like they love and care about sister. The people that are, that are trying to make sister happy, trying to take care of her, trying to placate her, bringing her treats and so, you know, attending to her or fighting with her and yelling at her and shaming her one way or the other, right? It can look both ways. Those people don't make sense either. They seem immature, less evolved. So we find somebody about our number. When we talk about in psychology, you marry your mother, you marry your father. This is what we mean. We don't mean that they look the same or have the same job. Maybe not even have some of the same personality traits. In fact, the thing that confuses us and obscures our vision about what's really happening is those things. The hairdo looks different. The profession looks different. The level of education might look different. All kinds of things look different. But we're attracted to the same level of differentiation. The same level of how we respond to sisters' upset feelings. So we find people that are somewhere in this model between a 60 and a 70. And here's what's fascinating to me. What does a 65 think about people that are a 40? I already mentioned it. They think about 40s as being immature, unevolved, young. They're, 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 they're not interesting to, 40s are not interesting to, to 65s. They seem like children who haven't grown up or chaotic. But here's where it's really interesting. What do 65s think about 90s? And the answer is 65s thinks about 90s that 90s don't care. What do your children, when your boundaries get better, what do your children accuse you of? They accuse you of not caring. If you try to stay boundaried with a partner in, in, in a conflict, in a, in a certain emotional matter, and you don't become reactive or, or, or cater to them, what do they accuse you of? They accuse you of not caring. 90s have taken themselves out of the drama. 90s can be present, 
but not do anything about it necessarily. They can show love and compassion, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to try to make it better or feel responsible for it to make it better. They're also not going to become reactive and shaming and punishing about it. So if you get healthier and move up the scale of differentiation, which is a fundamental measure of relationship health, the people around you will think that you're getting less healthy. They will accuse you of doing the wrong thing. Now, when I was explaining this to a group of parents some time ago, I've shared this before, the parents said to me, well, shouldn't we explain to the, if we become a 90, for example, and, and that's a big leap, by the way, on this differentiation skill, it takes years to, to move, decades to move from a 65 to a 90, practically a lifetime. And most people never get to a 90. It's a, it's a, it's a tall mountain to climb. But let's say we move from a 65 to a 70, 75. The people in our lives are not going to necessarily support it and see it as growth. They're going to accuse us of getting less healthy, of getting more selfish. Pick the description. And somebody asked, well, can't we explain to our children or to our partner or to our parents what's happening? Number one, it won't work. The explanation won't make sense. It'll be psychobabble to them. It'll be nonsense to them. But more important than that, 90s don't explain themselves to 65s. 90s don't explain themselves to anybody. 90s follow what, what people on al -Anon, uh mean when they say that no is a complete sentence. That you're responsible for your own serenity. 90s understand that you stay on your side of the street and all of the accusations about what you're becoming just fall to the ground at the feet of the 90. I'm using the numbers as, as, as hypothetical modeling, of course, but that's what differentiation looks like. And so part of the process of having a child in treatment or doing the intensive work is to move yourself up the scale. But it takes time. It takes a lot of work takes years and years and years because the programming is deep and unconscious and pre-verbal and non-verbal. It's in our fight and flight system. It is twisted up in our trauma. If you come from a family where you didn't feel like you were heard, most likely one of your commitments in life is going to be, I'm going to be the best listener in the world, but that can trip you up also. You can end up listening too much, too long to abusive people, to unkind people, to cruel people. So communication skills are, are not a tool simply to build connection between two people. They're a tool for the discovery of the self and its relationship to another person. And that's why communications themselves are fairly useless. When, when used in the wrong hands. As I've observed many times before, a hammer is a wonderful tool, but it can also be used for destruction, for vandalism, for murder. The hammer itself has no intrinsic value in it. Its value is only understood in the context of the person holding it. If it's a skilled carpenter, it has a lot of value. If it's an angry toddler, if it's an immature adult, it can be incredibly destructive and dangerous. So yes, we want you to learn communication schools, tools. We want you to learn the, the eight tips, the eight tools for connection and communication. We want you to learn those things, but we want you to understand what they mean, what they're for and what they're not for. And that makes all the difference in the world. I hope that makes sense to you. And thanks for your patience with my, my tickle, tickly throat. All right, folks, I'll take questions uh, on Thursday. We have another broadcast on Thursday. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You, are available on Amazon and Audible. Great Christmas presents, of course, for yourself, or for the people that you love. We have support groups, uh, wilderness support groups for alumni and current families, November 30th, this Thursday. Is it Thursday? Yep, this Thursday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. We also have an, a once-a-month alumni-only meeting, December 26th at 6.30 p.m., is that next offering. 
And then we have a once a month intensive support group. December 12th at 6 p.m. is that offering. Contact support groups at evoketherapy.com for more information. We have family treks for families. If you want to go out into the wilderness and have a multi-day experience with your child during the program, after the program, even if you don't have a child in the wilderness, but you love the outdoors and you love the the, the healing facilitation the, the, that being outdoors can, can support and provide for you, family treks are your offering. Contact admissions at evoketherapy.com. If you want a virtual coach, especially at this time of the holidays, it's a great time to talk about this. We have coaches that can work with you across the country, across the world, who are trained in the model that I'm describing and the principles that I'm talking about, and that can help with a variety of experiences, uh, especially having had uh, many of them having worked in programs for identified patients so they can help parents and spouses with that. We ask all current family members, all participants of our program to try just to experiment, just to consider any combination, six of any combination of the following 12 step support groups, alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, or adultchild.org. It doesn't matter which one you go to because they're all teaching about differentiation. They're all teaching you about what it means to be a person, a fallible, imperfect, wonderful, struggling, imp- you know, human. And what, what does it mean to be related to another person? That's what they talk about. And it is believed by these organizations who were created initially for the support of the spouses of alcoholics. It is believed that addiction and that mental illness in an individual and a family is reflective of issues around differentiation and individuation relationship. You could also try refugerecovery.org. That's a Buddhist inspired program with less of an emphasis on a higher power. And of course, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, has free classes and resources in your local community. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app or Spotify. Just search Finding You, a Evoke Therapy podcast. Follow and subscribe there. The new episodes will be, you'll be alerted when the new episodes come out. Um, if you'd like, please share and with other people and uh, rate us, give us feedback. You can also go to soundcloud.com on your computer and listen there. And Evoke's YouTube channel broadcasts the video recorded versions of these these broadcasts, like I said, about 24 hours after they first air. You can find find Evoke Therapy Programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter, threads, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy. And you can find the Evoke Intensives Program on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by using the handles Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives, and of course, our blog has wonderful content each week. Coming to the end of the year, if you want to make a donation for people who can't afford treatment, the three charitable partners that we work with are ChooseMentalHealth.org, Sky'sTheLimitFund.org, and EvokeFamilyFoundation.org. You can earmark your tax-deductible donation to these organizations for a specific program or for a specific issue or population if something is near and dear to your heart. My next broadcast will be in 48 hours. November 30th, this Thursday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I will take any leftover questions from this evening or anything that you email to webinar at evoketherapy.com anytime. Those will go to the top of the queue, and then I'll take live questions from the live audience after that. So I look forward to that. I hope this was a helpful point of contact. I hope it made sense to you. If you want to learn more about it, you can look at the podcast on the three circles where I talk about differentiation using that mo- <coughs> <coughs> using that model, which is a wonderful model. And for in behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you, thanks for showing up tonight and doing your work. Have a great evening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.